Um, so the, the construct of this, um, we're going to take, you know, approximately 20 minutes here just to, to present and then we want to leave the rest of the hour to create space for, for conversation and questions. Um, and yeah, I think I'll just hop right into it. So uh, next slide, please, Yali. So I, uh, to begin, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge um, that we're located here uh, on the traditional territory of the Algonquin people. Um, and that's, that's where our office is located in the, our whole team. And um, it's also known as the Songhees and Esquimalt peoples, um, whose historical relationship with the land continues today. Uh, and we're reminded on beautiful days like today, just how lucky we are to be in, in this space. Uh, next slide, please. So you can see the agenda, it looks a little overwhelming with everything we have here, um, but we're gonna try and just go through all the components of our program um, and make sure that there's clarity. And once again, if there's anything um, that is of confusion that you think it will be challenging or concerned with, it's really important that we create this space for the conversation. Next slide, please. A little bit of housekeeping. I think first we just wanted to acknowledge that we're going to be recording this. Um, we're recording all of our webinars on uh, our program and we'll be posting them on our LGCAP webpage. Um, this is just so that there's a resource available to go back and check out um, or for those who are unable to attend so they can see what's there. We'll also be providing the decks as well. Uh, the session is live transcript enabled um, and so you can, you can activate that if you're wanting to. And um, we have a small group, so we can make this really quite interactive, but we do ask while we're presenting, if you can please have your, your mic muted during the presentation, just so we have no background noise. Um, for most of these, we've said, hey, if, if you have questions throughout, you can type them in the chat box. Um, but once again, since we have a small group, um, I maybe we'll just go off script a little bit here and say, feel free to unmute yourselves uh, if you feel more comfortable with that and ask questions throughout or type the questions in. Uh, we're blessed to be uh, have Anna there who will be keeping an eye on the chat to, to keep us on point to make sure everything does get answered throughout the, the presentation. Um, and once again, going off script, it does say here Q&A at the end, um, but we're I think we can approach this in a way where as we're going through it, just please don't hesitate to ask questions as, as we're going through. We just want to make sure everything is clear. Next slide, please. So some notes, um, I think it was uh, perhaps a bit of a surprise when the program was launched in year one because we did so quite rapidly. In uh, mid-May of 2022, we launched this program um, and uh, with a limited amount of engagement or conversation in advance. And so we really wanted to take the opportunity once we got through year one of our program to create more of a space for dialogue conversation on how we could move forward. So from January to March of this year, uh, we did a, a series of engagements around the province. And you can see there's a number of locations we went to. Um, and we had input provided by over 200 um, local government staff and by modern treaty nation staff as well. We did a dedicated session to um, discussing with modern treaty nations how to make our, our program most useful uh, so there was not barriers, impediments, uh, and effective moving forward. And based on this engagement, there's quite a bit of information that we heard that is informing how the program is gonna look for, for, for years to and beyond. Um, I think some additional components that I wanna to touch upon in mid-March when we did have our virtual session with Modern Treaty Nations, it was four nations that did attend and we had a very fruitful conversation on the program and how to make it most effective and uh, work moving forward. And um, I think what we heard quite quite clearly was, first of all, each nation is quite unique uh, geographically, culturally, in terms of climate impacts and local priorities. And we were wanting to understand how we could best make this program fit to these individual circumstances. The program is meant for all of us. It's not a provincial here, we want you to do this. It is definitely a two-way street. And that's what climate action at uh, Modern Treaty Nation local government level is always meant to be. Um, and we want to make sure that we're creating a program that fits within, within those sort of views. So we continue to emphasize that our program has this element of flexibility um, and that's not going to change. And we want to work with you on that flexibility. So if there is components that don't work, 
we're always open to conversations, be that timelines, be that the reporting requirements, we're always open to the conversation. And what we're fortunate is our program is not legislated, it's not regulated, it's a voluntary program. So we have that flexibility to, to change things and make things work. We did emphasize that there's this need from a provincial perspective um, and what we were hearing from everyone we engaged with that there's this desire to reduce emissions, but that you know um, there may be limited ways of doing so. So how can we effectively ensure there's information resources to, 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 to do so? And as we go through today, you'll, you'll see we've provided quite a bit in the way of resources uh, and support to hopefully uh, support on reducing emissions. We also heard quite strongly that First Nations are disproportionately impacted by hazards such as flooding, storms, fire. And so how can we ensure that the uh, climate preparedness, adaptation, risk assessment component of our program could be uh, more, not more emphasized, but it is available. And we continue to emphasize all of your LGCAP dollars can be spent on those aspects. Um, and that's important to note. It's, there's no, it has to be spent on mitigation or these particular components that flexibility is paramount and we did hear that um, resilience is a, a key component of concern so that need to focus on resilience and adaptation and we just want to emphasize back that um, we hear that and we encourage that um seeing if there's anything else i want to touch upon this particular side um yeah we did receive a question about putting funds toward work to improve land and water and support traditional activities like hunting gathering and fishing and what we want to say is yes, absolutely. This all falls within the broad category of resilience. Um, so please um, don't, um, if, if you're, you're wanting to look to use your LGCAP funding for, for those, those, those things, please know that you can. So next slide, please. So I think it's reiterating that this program, where it came from is it was a commitment made under our provincial uh, on the plan, Clean BC Roadmap to 2030. And you can see here that that climate plan has been uh, partitioned into sort of eight categories. And what we want to emphasize is that the Lower Government Climate Action uh, Program, it came out of that community's pathway. Um, and it uh, essentially was something where there's this recognition that at the local government level, at the community level, um, Communities directly control or influence over 50% of energy and emissions in British Columbia. And how are you going to be able to achieve success without collaboratively working with everyone on the ground um, to move forward? Um, and so just wanting to reiterate, this is something that comes out of a provincial climate plan. It's not something that uh, that, that grew out of you know some some conversations that happen at the side. It is. It was a, a bold commitment that was made out of, of this clean BC roadmap to 2030. Next slide, please. You may recall when we were doing our engagement, for those of you that attended, that we also brought forth that um, there's a number of sort of key actions that we are encouraging, uh, but not saying it needs to be the case to focus um, your LGCAP funding, uh, your climate action pathway on. And you can see through here, these are ones that we pulled out of our provincial climate plan, our provincial climate preparedness and adaptation strategy uh, as initiatives that we would sort of gently encourage you to consider when you're receiving your funding to move forward. Um, and what we've done as a result of these climate action priorities is enhanced our survey that will be going out to everyone on an annual basis to be focused more on the impacts of the program. Uh, we've heard loud and clear that people wanna know when it comes to LGCAP, what has been the impact of the program? So we're gonna be asking for key performance indicators. We're gonna be asking for potentially what the emission reductions are. We're gonna be asking for metrics on how you've created more resilient communities. We're gonna be asking, did you create sustainability positions? We're gonna be asking, did you use the LGCAP funding to leverage more funding? Because on aggregate, if we can report this information back, it will just ensure the continuity of our program. It will ensure that people are aware just, uh, at a community level of the importance of this program. And our desire, quite frankly, we have a vested interest is to grow this program more broadly. Next slide, please. We'd like to also highlight um, that LGCAP is just one component of funding that exists for uh, modern treaty nations um, when it, it comes to, to climate action. Um, 
we've we have a number a number of other sort of pathways and we want to highlight them on this particular slide. So I think first and foremost, we want to highlight Climate Ready BC, and this is an online platform. It's to help the public and communities understand disaster and climate risks and find funding and supports to make communities more resilient. Uh, we know in a BC context that we've had just a significant number of challenging years from a climate perspective. Uh, and we look even at this weekend and how warm it's going to be in mid-May in British Columbia. And I'm sure we're all thinking in our minds, what does this mean moving forward for the upcoming summer? Um, this platform is also a hub for future collaboration and growth. And the intent here is for Climate Ready BC that it will evolve through engagement with First Nations, local governments, and other partners to become just a better tool uh, that will be available for everyone to use. There's also the Community Emergency Preparedness Fund. And this is a, a suite of funding streams intended to enhance the resiliency of local governments, First Nations and communities in responding to emergencies. And this funding is provided by the province of BC and is administered um, by the Union of British Columbia Municipalities. Um, and then, bear with me here for a sec. Is administered, sorry, for the uh, Union of British Columbia Municipalities. And it, it's administered for the following. It's um, for extreme temperature risk mapping and assessment planning, disaster risk reduction and climate adaptation, uh, volunteer and composite fire departments, equipment and training, and indigenous cultural safety and cultural humility training. Um, and then finally at the, the bottom there, we have the BC Community Climate Action Funding Guide. And this is something we created out of the Climate Action Secretariat. Uh, a couple of years ago, and we heard loud and clear people were asking, is there a one-stop shop we can go to to understand climate funding as opposed to having to go piecewise to different provincial ministry websites? So we always encourage that the community climate funding um, website is something that you leverage. There's a number of filters on it, it is updated regularly, and it's a good spot to go and see what's happening in regards to climate funding available um, for, for local governments for modern treaty nations around British Columbia. So I think with that, Yahali, I'm passing on to you for the next slide, correct? Yeah, thanks, Ken. Great, so now with all of that context in mind, and Ken, I'm not sure, I know you said that we're recording and we'll provide the, um, the recording for access afterwards, but also we'll email out the slide deck afterwards. Um, so, you'll have all of the links and information there at the ready. So for the program itself, the thing to emphasize, as Ken said, is the flexibility of how funds can be used. So really for whatever the priorities are in your community or communities, uh, we do ask that um, that those actions taken align at least in part with the Clean BC Roadmap and the Climate Preparedness and Adaptation Strategy. But having said that, pretty much anything that I can imagine that um, will be going on or has been going on um, on the ground will align because it's so all-encompassing. Really anything to do with reducing emissions and anything to do with adaptation and resilience. So you'll see in the survey that we've got questions um, asking for you to highlight initiatives that are going on uh, in your communities. And again, uh, so funds can be put towards staffing contracts, um, infrastructure, infrastructure projects, they can be put in reserve year over year if, if you want to save them up for something that is more costly. And we ask that as we only at this point have funding for three years initially, that you spend the funds by the end of March, 2025. So here's just a quick snapshot of the amounts going out to each nation. Um, in many cases, it's, it's not a ton of money, but we really hope that uh, it can be put to some good use and also leverage. That's another thing that I forgot to mention about the flexibility of funding. You can use it to leverage other sources of funding. Jordi, I see you've got a, your hand up, go ahead. So the funding, is it 
like with Tawasin, you have membership and then you have leaseholders. Would it be in total membership plus leaseholders? Um, I'm not sure that I understand that question in terms of how, like the geographic so scope. I, I, understand, I understand like a portion of it is set. Every community is going to get the same amount, but then you're going to get at, um, an added, added value based on population. So our population, Tawasin has membership, which are member TFN members. Yeah. And then on TFN lands, you have lease, leasehold land, right? So they're leaseholders. So in total, we have, say, roughly 250 members. But on living on TFN lands, we have roughly almost 2,000 people, right? And therefore, shouldn't we get, like, how do we get funds based on what type of population? That's all. Okay, that's an excellent question. Um, Ken, can you speak to where the the population stats came from? I can actually, and maybe Jordy, if you want to hold on to that question for a thought or for a second, I'm actually going to dig that up right now, um, and I'll jump in in a slide or so once uh, once I find it. Yeah, you know, I'll just put my hand up and then I can respond. Okay, sounds good. Thank, thank you. Um, yeah, that. That go before I joined the team is when they um, put the stats together. So I'm very curious about the answer to that as well. And also raises a good point that there's a base amount of funding that goes to every local government in modern treaty nation, and that is 40,082. And then the population amount on top of that. So uh, like Tokot um, would be just getting the base based on the small, the size of the population. Ken, can you also, I know, sorry to interrupt your search, but so no I, I don't have the, you know, the individual community nation populations at my fingertips, but if there's under a certain number, like, is there a cutoff then for not having that population amount on top of the base amount? No, so everyone receives a top up. Everyone, and sorry, the base funding is 38,082, um, not 40,082. The minimum that anyone receives is 40,082. Um, I think the smallest population is like 100 and it equates to uh, with our, our weighting and additional 2,000. Um, okay. But yeah, I, I'm going to find those numbers right now, Jordi. Um, and for everyone's benefit, I can tell you what the populations we provided and where we received them. Um, just bear with me here for a second. I can dig it up because I know the resource and I know where it's sitting. Okay, great. So a little bit about what to expect from the survey. Um, many or all of you may have seen the survey last year. It's somewhat different this year and we hope easier to fill out. There are fewer uh, open text boxes and more tick boxes. Um, what else should I say about it? There are still some text boxes. Often they're, they're marked as optional so that you can share more information if you want to, but don't have to. Key one here, emissions reporting. So. What we heard when we were doing our engagement sessions this past winter and spring um, is that many communities across the province, modern treaty nations included, don't have the capacity or are not interested for one reason or another in doing that. So it is optional this year. We do certainly encourage it. If you have any questions about methodology or resources to help do that emissions tracking and reporting, then please reach out and we'll certainly help as much as we can, um, but not necessary to get the funding. So we do also ask this year how funds have been or will be used if that is known. And that's really key for us, as Ken mentioned, to put forward back to our treasury board to ask for the funding to be continued. So everyone will receive an email on May 15th. So that's next Monday with a URL to the survey and instructions on how to fill that out. Also one thing that is more streamlined and straightforward than last year is 
Last year, there was a separate attestation form that needed to be filled out and submitted to us. This year, it's embedded. It's at the very end of the survey. So that needs to be signed by your uh, chief financial officer or equivalent position and can all be submitted at once. And there is a little button there also to download a version for yourself. Once you're done filling out the survey, you can get a PDF or a Word version and that will be used for making it public, which is another one of the requirements. I have another question. Yeah, go ahead. Like once you fill out the form and then I have to get it signed by the CFO, like how do I share that form with him so he can sign off on it? Yes, excellent question. So the URL is unique to Tawasin and you can hit save at the bottom of each page and then come back to it. So you can just send, send um, another staff member the URL and they can go on at, at any time. Yeah, and that's really important because for most um, communities, we've heard that certainly staff from across departments need to weigh in and fill out different pieces. So yeah, that is how it works. And if there are any issues, please reach out and let us know. It's our first time using this tool. It's called Simple Survey. So uh, hopefully it goes really smoothly. And what else was I going to say? Can't remember. Um, I think so. I spoke to reporting on projects that are aligned with the roadmap and preparedness and adaptation strategy. That attestation form is where uh, the, the attestation to commit and dedicate funds to climate action comes in. So that's how uh, we get that commitment. And then the survey with that form embedded in it needs to be pub made public. And what we mean by that, and this is in the program guide, is you can put it on the website, you can put it in um, any kind of meeting minutes that are made public. If there's a newsletter that goes out, it just needs to be somehow in, in the public realm. Right, so again, May 15th, the emails will go around with unique URLs. Please let us know if you don't receive it. We have a list of what we call primary contacts and then other folks uh, who we keep track of as well. We're going to send everyone an email to let them know that the reporting is open and hopefully you can share around that URL with whoever needs to use it. And we ask that it be submitted by 4 p.m. on July 31st and then make it public by the end of September. But really wanna stress that if this timeline does not work for you, please let us know and we will, we're, we have flexibility to extend that timeline. So we are in the background updating the webpage right now. So if you go to it now, it won't be, it'll be from last year. Not that helpful, but as of Monday, you will see uh, pro the program guide that will walk you through what you need to do with the survey. We also will have a link on the webpage to what we call a survey template, but essentially it's a word version of the survey. And you can use that to pass also around to other staff members, collect the information if you want to uh, in advance of going to the online version. And then what we've heard from staff is that that can be really useful. Then one person can just go online and cut and paste it all. So that's available. There's also an FAQ document that uh, has a lot of good info and we also will, like we said, be putting the, the recordings. Actually, I should have updated the slide deck. I'm gonna to email to you all afterwards instead of putting it online. So this you can totally disregard if you're not planning on doing emissions reporting, 
but we do have a whole bunch of resources. They may be useful, they may not, as the scope um, will be very different community by community, depending on what uh, services your government is providing. This is designed for you know, traditional services delivered by local governments. Um, and we've also, we've developed a tool that can be used to create your inventory. Um, but again, I, Ken, do you wanna say anything about the potential usefulness? Of these tools? Yeah. I can, um, and it's, your timing was perfect. So what I might first do is I found the answer Jordy to a question, so I'll answer that and then I can talk about these tools. So the population values that we used, um, we uh, got those population values from um, Government of Canada through their Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs uh, census data. Um, and through that, we have the population values that uh, we use for modern treaty nations. And so just to see if this resonates with you, for a Sawasan First Nation, we had a population value of 380. Uh, based on that census data for 2020 at the time when we were looking at what the populations were for the attribution. And I have the values for all the other modern treaty nations. If, um, so was that 2020? Correct, okay. yeah. Yeah, like that. that's our membership, TFM members, in which we okay. go through the federal government. Like, I wonder where leaseholder census data would be captured and where you can find that to add on top of that, right? Because that's just membership though. That's, then we have like, so how this is gonna impact TFN when TFN's fully built out, we'll have mm -hmm. like 8,000 leaseholders and we'll have maybe 400 to 500 members, right? So mm -hmm. if we're getting, if we're providing services to 8,000 and 500 people, but we're only getting funding as if we're uh, servicing 500 people, there's the disconnect, right? So I wonder where, what census data would pick up the leaseholders on TFN lands? Because the census was like 2020 and it should have been in total of who's, whoever's on TFN lands. It would also impact Lawman. Same here. Uh, we have it, leaseholders as well, not on the scale that you do, but yeah. I wonder if that could be part of the survey. Like, are these uh, values going to be updated every year or is the annual amount for each nation already set? Like, could that be part of the survey that we self-report how many people live on our lands? Yeah, so these are really good questions. And the, the way I'd frame it is we were given an aggregate amount of money for the program and we were provided with a few constraining factors. And so we came up with an attribution formula um, that we could consistently allocate across um, everyone who is uh, participating. Um, and those values have been locked in for a static amount for three years. But this is really good feedback because we could incorporate it when we are going back to our treasury board and we're asking for what the program will look like after year three. So this is year two. So the value that for those of you that participate in year one received will be the same value that will be available this year and the same value that will be available next year. But um, our intent, quite honestly, our desire here is for this program to grow, to expand um, uh, for everyone, but we can also look at the attribution methodology based on what you're telling us about population attribution. Because if you're servicing a greater population, that's something we want to consider. Um, but I think in consultation with um, our, our colleagues within the province, they had suggested that this was a, a good data source to, to, to have for populations of modern tree nations, but really appreciating um, some of the potential deficiencies in, the, in this, this this methodology. Yeah, like I understand many programs, they're based on population and usually you get population data every census. So that's a limiting factor every five years or whatever it is. Yeah. But then if it doesn't account for all the people that live on your lands, but you're providing services, that's um, right. Because we have a, our own sewage treatment plant, which doesn't service 300 people. It services 2,000 with the capacity of servicing 8,000. And that's that's a big source of CO, CO2 for us, yep. just as an example. But I understand you got your information, how, how it is. But just going forward, yeah, please consider this. And I understand that, you know, you've 
you've done your calculations based on your assumptions for the next three years, and this is year two. And I understand that this will probably be the way it is for next year. But going forward after that, perhaps there could be a correction based on new information. Absolutely. Yeah. And thank you very much for bringing this to our attention. I think that this is something that's quite valuable for us to uh, to understand uh, moving forward. Um, and and but, like, if, if you want, I can I can talk to sort of the other departments and say, hey, like for leaseholders, like where are they captured in the census? And I can report that information back to you for you, for your future knowledge. That'd be very much appreciated, Jordi. Um, especially if that's something that we could find for all modern treaty nations. So we can we can apply that evenly as well, right? Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Yeah, and this is great because we could add a question to the survey, like you suggested, Carmen, to, to ask for that total number. Um, so sorry, going back to Yali, your, your initial uh, suggestion just on these materials. So I think as you're all aware, um, based on um, the population figures we're using for modern treaty nations, all modern tra treaty nations in British Columbia, your populations fall below 15,000. So corporate measurement is being very much encouraged, but is not a requirement for the program this year. So if it can be done, you, you'll still receive your funding um, if you submit your qualitative survey. That being said, we want to support and we would like to grow uh, that corporate measurement through these um, resources that we're providing. Um, so I think step one, there's a lot here, but step two, we're here as a resource. And step three, we're trying to make these as intuitive and user-friendly as possible. We did do a session this morning. I'm not sure if any of you had an opportunity to attend it on corporate measurement. It was an hour and a half. There was a lot there. We'll be posting that recording. Uh, and we did a demo of some of the tools we've created that we're hoping will be intuitive. Um, so what I would say is we heard loud and clear in year one, the need for more supports and resources on corporate measurement. We're providing those, and then we want to continue to learn how these are being leveraged and utilized as we move to year three. I think it's also important to note that what we're saying for this year, um, those below 15,000 population are being encouraged but not required to do corporate measurement. Those over 15,000 population are. Um, that by no means means in year three, this will remain consistent. I think our vision is that everyone is able to do corporate measurement at some point, but that will be done through conversations and engagement to see where everyone is at on an annual basis, recognizing at the end of the day, we want to get all the money out the door to support climate action in British Columbia, but we need to, to do that in a way where we need to understand everyone's unique situations and how to best support them. So I think those are the key things I'd like to emphasize in regards to these materials um, that exist and will be posted on our LGCAP webpage on Monday if everything goes according to plan. Yeah, and I, I want to say that the word corporate is all over here. We also understand that that's doesn't, it's not relevant for modern treaty nations. We understand that your, you know, services provided do not necessarily align, um, I'm assuming don't align with the way that these tools are laid out. Um, so yeah, again, if you are looking to do this type of tracking and reporting, then reach out to us and we'll support as best we can. All right, so now this is just a sneak peek. This is not a screenshot of the updated version, but it'll give you an idea of what to expect when you do go to the web page and really wanted to highlight that there will be a quick links uh, box on the right side that will have all of the key documents that you need. So the program guide, uh, the template that I mentioned, that Word version of the survey that you can use to prepare for the online one, Ignore where it says attestation form there, you won't need a separate form for that and frequently asked questions. Also a little sneak peek into the program guide itself. It's laid out to walk you through anything that you need to know to complete the survey and some terms at the end. If that is useful, please check that out. And this is what the attestation form looks like, again, in the online survey um, to have your CFO or equivalent 
sign off on. So to reiterate key dates, Monday, May 15th to July 31st is the official reporting period, but do not hesitate to let us know if you need an extension. The funds will be dispersed by, we're saying end of August, first week of September at the latest, and then again, make your survey public by end of September. And also to note that that version that goes public, you can change the look and feel of it. It doesn't have to be the way that it gets downloaded from the online tool. You can do essentially what you want with it as long as it includes the questions and the answers that are required. Anything in there that's noted as optional, even if you do fill it out, if you wanna omit that from your public version, that's completely up to you. And that is it. Um, hoping that that was helpful and very uh, keen to hear any questions or issues that you may have. I'll stop sharing the screen. Was that clear as mud or helpful? It was very we, helpful. We, yeah. Okay. Um, do you want us to be sending you like a copy of the public, uh, whatever we do with it, like a poster or whatever I do? No, no need to do it unless you want to, if you're like super excited and want me to take <laughs> then um, for sure, I'm happy to look at it, but no, not necessary. Okay. And then for the emissions calculations, like back to Jordy's point, should I only be like calculating what uh, is servicing like the, the status people that were included in those calculations? Like say we have like 220 homes that are probably captured in that. Does it matter um, what I measure the emissions on? That's a really good question. That's a really good question. I think you are the one who said that you're, you are planning on doing that this year. At, or at some point, right? Yeah, it's something we're interested in so that we can set more goals. Okay, I mean, I would say that whoever your, whatever the population is that is actually receiving those services and whatever the services are designed for, then that should be the scope of it. Um, as long as you think that year over year, should you decide to do this annually or every two, three, five years, whatever the frequency that it's consistent over time so that you internally, right. um, most importantly, contract for yourselves. Okay. I, the, maybe another framing I'd provide on this is not necessarily who the services are being delivered to, but the services that, that you have influence over. Because, mm. and that means by having that information that can support evidence-based decision-making that you want to, to do in regards to reducing the emissions or making those systems more resilient. Yeah. So um, anything that you have control and influence over is what I, I would encourage you um, to, to track. But okay. all that being said, recognizing that um, it's not a requirement for those with populations under 15,000, um, we also don't want you to make this really challenging or difficult on yourself. So we're here as a support, we're here as a resource, and let's see how we can do this most effectively. Um, and then best position you in the future for being able to do that full inventory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, let us know when you start to dig into it, if that time comes. Because um, we've got Ken, you know, who's knowledge is so extensive and then another couple of people on our team who are not with us today who are more than happy to just dig into it with you we do recognize that on monday when all of this information goes live and the survey comes out um, that that, that there will likely be more questions so please don't hesitate to reach out of uh, out to us i'd also note that on the survey i don't think we've said this yet but um, we did user testing and Yali, do you recall who we did it with? We got a lot of good feedback from one of the modern treaty nations on our survey. That, Thanks, um, Ken. Yeah. yeah, I'm totally drawing a blank um, on her name and community. Brilliant, I need to drink more coffee. Um, but yeah, we did, we had just a one-on-one -on -one session. And so we have a separate version for modern treaty nations 
which was something that we uh, heard would be helpful. So that version will hopefully be, it's, it's for the most part the same, but there are a few small but significant changes that we hope make it more culturally relevant and appropriate. One really interesting thing that we did here was there's a question about different components or people in the community that are most vulnerable to climate hazards and impacts. And we had women as one of those categories and we were asked to add men. Um, and the thinking there was around the fact that typically, of course, a big generalization, but that women have often formed uh, networks, intergenerational networks where knowledge is being passed down, whereas that isn't as often the case for men. So they may not have as much knowledge of the land, for example, um, and then therefore maybe more vulnerable. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that, but. Oh, it's a deep question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there, there's a box there. If you want to tick men, then um, okay. Feel, yeah. And yeah, and happy to um, you know hear any feedback on the survey when you do see it. It'll be late for this year, but like we want to keep improving it year over year. So. Yeah, really emphasizing this isn't the province's program. This is our program. And we're so fortunate. Once again, it's voluntary and we can change it every year um, to make it the best program possible. Uh, and that's exciting for us because we know lots of people who are stuck in legislation regulation. And if they want to change one word, it's probably a six month process. So we don't have to go through that. <laughs> yeah. And Jordy, just really want to say that the the comments that you made when you participated in our engagement session, I really took to heart. And I think our whole team really appreciated, like really wanting to make sure that there's nothing about this that comes across as like the province saying what you need to do. Like, we're just trying to get this money out to you so that you can do what you need to do with it. Well, I would have to say that I really appreciate your flexibility in this. Um, I hope I'm unmuted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. Um, anyway, I really appreciate your flexibility. I mean, we've we're looking at this from a different perspective. We're not as concerned about uh, greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, we're a small community, and unfortunately, a lot of our heating is is with uh, wood stoves. But aside from that, um, it, and that's almost going to be impossible to change uh, in any way. But um, we're looking at this as a way of protecting a one of our uh, national historic site that is on the coast and is subject to uh, uh, water levels and, and also warming as well. And uh, so we've taken the approach that we're going to use this funding to actually for mitigation and adaptation. And uh, we, we want to protect this site. And we're, we have a study, two studies underway right now on how to do that. And so as soon as I get the results of those, um, which should be the next month, I'll send them to you. And then this year, the new, the newer, um, I guess, project will be to actually do some work uh, on the site to begin some some mitigation activity, so that it's not going to be washed away. Well, I don't know that we can stop it necessarily, but it's literally right on a beach that's really subject to high water, mm -hmm. and I don't know how we're going to stop that. But uh, at this point, but uh, that's the action we want to take with this to preserve this site. So uh, I don't know, that's why I appreciate your flexibility in looking at this. It's not, we're not looking at it as a people-based or a building-based approach to uh, the climate. It's really, how do we stop this particular site from being washed away, so. Hmm. Well, that sounds like such an important initiative and certainly so relevant across the province and across the world with sea level rise and storm surges and all of those hazards really going to get worse over time, I assume. Although I know it's very, I'm keen to see the, the studies that you're doing because it's so locally specific in terms of what actually happens on the land. So, uh, so yeah, great that you're able to get that done. 
Well, it's partially applicable to other West Coast communities too. Mm. I mean, you know, they're they're facing the same issues, um, yeah. directly facing, I guess, West. So the storm surge in, in the high water is a little bit worse than you might get somewhere else. But uh, yeah, you know, for instance, we're looking at what plants can we replant to stop mm. the sand, so the sand from being washed away. Yeah, things like that. So anyway. As I said, I appreciate your flexibility in looking at this. Okay, well, great. I appreciate that feedback and just I get excited about that kind of stuff because there is actually like amazing things that can be done with just the, we call them like e ecological approaches, kind of the nature. Nature is amazing. So yeah, I'm keen to see what you guys are able to do with that. And Jim, just on that note and for, for everyone on the line, um, we are going to be looking at how we can highlight more of the information that comes out of this program, out of the surveys. Mm. Um, we're hearing that everyone wants to know what are modern treaty nations and local governments doing on climate action? And they're asking our team to do a better job of taking that information and, and putting it out there and highlighting it. Um, so just all of you know that the information that you're providing in your surveys, we're going to be looking for these innovative, great stories that we can highlight so that other local governments, modern treaty nations, indigenous communities across British Columbia and across Canada, and perhaps even further, can see, learn, and perhaps apply them in their own backyard. Mm. Yeah. 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 So we may reach out if you put something about that or other projects in the survey. We may give you a call to say, hey, can we put this uh, in the report that comes out in the fall and maybe get a, a good photo to go with it if you have it? Mm -hmm. If you're interested, no pressure. Don't you don't have to. We have some good photos of storm surge. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> All right. Well, if any other questions come up, I'm not seeing any thing right now, but if anything comes up after you hang up or at 3 a.m. or anytime, we are here. And Anna, we're so glad that she joined our team. She's going to be monitoring our email and helping us out with so much. Um, so we'll be able to get back to you really quickly and whatever works best, phone call, video call, regular phone call. <laughs> <laughs> I had a call with Ken the other day and I said, why don't we just not use video? Because sometimes it's just it's too mm -hmm. much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can go for a walk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay Thank well thanks everyone. so much for joining today and till next time great thank you thank you everyone bye everyone bye hello hi do we have to do anything <laughs> to make sure that it's no i think i just end it um okay. Yeah, just like the corporate reporting one this morning, I just hit end and it processed in the cloud. Okay, I'm going to leave then. I'll let you do it. <laughs> <laughs> Good work in there. That was great. Thanks. Bye.